referencing the title of our of our talk today. Well, imagination's truths, mm -hmm. uh, re-envisioning the imagination in what do we say, philosophy of religion and the arts. Um, what does it mean to you to speak in terms of imagination's truths? Mm -hmm. Well, on the face of it, it would seem that imagination is about unreality. Therefore, if you define truth as reality, it's about untruth. But um, there are certain truths proper to fiction, and certain truths that one can only access arguably through fiction. Um, Aristotle in the Poetics, which is probably our first philosophical account of the relationship of truth and fiction, makes the point that it's not historians who recount the facts and give you a chronicle of events that get to the truth of what happens. It's the poets who prescind from the facts but aim at an essence, what he calls the essence of events. And they do this through a process of mimesis, creative imitation, representation. And uh, mythos, that's our word myth, but in the Greek it's plot. So there is a restructuring and a reconfiguring of the facts such that we are able to see what is universal in human actions and human sufferings. And that for Aristotle is something that's only accessible through art. Uh, other philosophers have said interesting things uh, on foot of that to leap into the modern era. Hume, David Hume maintained that uh, all men are liars and poets are liars by profession. So that poets actually take the, uh, the ways in which we use imagination in our lives to construct meanings and then bring them to a higher level so that we become aware that we're actually constructing meanings. And Nietzsche uh, goes further still when he says there are no facts, there are only interpretations of facts, and interpretations of facts involve imagination, the constructive, productive, constitutive role of imagination. Uh, and he ultimately uh, concludes that there are two kinds of liars. There are those who tell lies and don't know they're telling lies, because our imaginations are always at work, even when we're dreaming and perceiving and eating, imagination is always at work, symbolizing them. Uh, giving meaning to things. Um, so uh, the distinction he makes is between authentic liars who know that they're lying and they're the poets or those who avail of the poets and the artists work and so uh, realize how the lie is performed. So there are the liars who deny they're lying and they're the inauthentic ones and the liars who acknowledge that they're lying and they're the authentic ones. And of course, in the latter sense, uh, the lie is, as Samuel Beckett says, lyingly exposed. And when it's exposed and performed, then we have a freedom around it, and it ceases to be a lie. It actually becomes a truth. Um, so I would claim that there is a truth proper to fiction in this way. If I might just uh, give an example, practical example. A number of years ago, I was giving a talk in Montreal on the uh, on different cinematic portrayals of the Holocaust. So I was talking about Schindler's List and uh, Life is Beautiful and Show by Claude Lanzmann. And going through the various pros and cons, you know, the, of doing a fictional dramatic uh, recounting of the event Schindler's List versus Show, which is you know two camera face-to-face uh, -face testimonials of survivors, first-generation survivors. And after it, um, this little woman came up to me after question and answer, and she said, you know, I was one of the, one of the survivors. I was on Schindler's List. And she said, I was never able to return to the experience, never able to revisit it, never able to talk about it, never able to think about it, remember it, until I saw the film. And when I saw the fictional account played by fictional characters, I was then and only then able to identify with myself yeah. as a real victim. But it was only by going through it in imagination, by the detour of fiction, by um, a certain vicarious 
uh, journey that she was able to come back to what was in effect an inexperienced experience. So it took fiction for her to be able to experience it for the first time. Mm. And that to me is a case in which fiction can actually serve to bring out a truth that otherwise remains concealed. Why? Because it's just unbearable. So fiction can say it in another way and make the unbearable bearable, which is one of the main points Aristotle makes in the poetics. He says, look, when we go to the theatre and we see tragedies, we witness events. Uh, Agamemnon slitting the throat of poor Iphigenia, uh, Oedipus committing murder and incest, most hideous things. Um, and these are things we could never uh, contemplate or never um, accept or tolerate or experience or regard in real life. But through the detour of fiction, we can look at the most hideous things, the most difficult things, the most painful things, the most tragic things, and uh, see them in a new way. So for him, that was a very liberating thing, because <clears throat> two of the most um, powerful, but very often unacknowledged, we today might say unconscious emotions uh, in Greek society and all societies were pity and fear, which were pathomata, they were, they were passions. And too much fear or too much pity could destroy a society. Uh, Over-identification with people, too much pathos, or uh, too, too, too much alias, you know, pity, or uh, too much fear could be to violence and, and distance and cruelty. So what you needed was an imaginary synthesis of these two emotions, so as in a way to depathologize them, civilize them, and then the citizens who would go and have their, their unconscious passions uh, purged and distilled and refined and refigured would then go back into society uh, more um, more, yeah, more, more human and humanized citizens. Mm -hmm. What does that do about Adorno's um, uh, thought about the, um, the barbarity of poetry after the Holocaust? How does that fit in? Well, I think that Adorno was making a dramatic rhetorical point. Um, I think what I think it's just untrue. Thankfully, <laughs> there have been great poets after the Holocaust. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I'm not talking about poets who ignore the Holocaust, I'm also talking very importantly about those who acknowledge that the Holocaust. Uh, so Paul Salam would be a perfect example. I mean, if you don't have Paul Salam's poetry, there is no literary, you know, genuine literary witness in poetry to the event. And then as Levinas says, well, it's forgotten. And if it's, if it's not remembered, and remembered in a way that can be commonly um, shared through literature, then, and humanly shared through literature, uh, then the Nazis have won, because the Nazis didn't want anybody to remember it. They, they, they wanted it to pass over, everybody to pass over it in silence. They, they refused to keep any records and so on. So in that sense, ironically, if one were to obey a donor's call, one would be doing the bidding of the Nazis, which is exactly what, the opposite of what he wanted. Yeah. I think probably what he should have said is, one, after Auschwitz, who can write beautiful poetry in the sense of, a poetry or a literature that doesn't acknowledge the horror that has traversed history. I think he did change his mind mm. in the end. I think mm. he did really, really go on that. Okay. Okay, let's move on here. Yeah. Um, why might the concept of imagination, well, maybe you've touched on this uh, a little bit, mm. need to be seen in new ways? Um, I mean, there's more to say about, about that uh, than, than it was, you know, a matter of fiction or un mm. you know, unbelief. Yeah, well, I think, uh, I think the challenge for contemporary understandings of and uh, discussions of imagination is to sort of avoid two traditional pitfalls. On the one hand, the notion that the image is a purely passive receptor, an impression or an imprint left after our empirical experience through the senses. And this would be a view that you'd find in certain scholastic philosophies and then very much in human lock empiricism, it's called empiricism, um, where basically our ideas are faded images which themselves are faded impressions. So everything leads back to, to the senses 
but in sort of a reductive, quasi-materialist sense. So that's image as imitation in a passive, purely representational sense. And that doesn't get really what imagination is. And if it does, then kind of Plato is right in the Republic to say that images are simply poor parents of poor children mm -hmm. because they are merely copies of reality, which itself for Plato is but a copy, empirical, natural reality of a transcendental truth. So images are a two removes from truth. So if you take that idea of the image as a copy, then clearly one is going to denigrate imagination. And in Western philosophy, imagination was very often, and for the most part, a suspect entity. Uh, the other extreme to be avoided would be sort of a constructivist, if I can use a horrible word, approach to the image, which says, well, there's nothing meaningful in reality at all, so any meaning we have is given by the image. So in that sense, you enter into kind of a fictionalism almost, or a constructivism, where, and kind of Nietzsche at his extreme would be this, uh, we just make up meanings as we go along. So in that sense, the image becomes kind of um, imperial and imperious in its ability to create the world by fiat and has no fidelity or loyalty or answerability to reality at all. So I think, you know, the image as imitation of the image is pure imitation of the image as pure artifice are both um, extremes mm -hmm. that misrepresent the, the real power of imagination, which is both to receive and to create, to recreate. And I think um, the hermeneutic definition of Paul Ricoeur that is very useful, where he says, imagination is invention. And he takes the origin of the word invention from the Latin invenio to be at once an invention. We invent, we create, we produce, but we do not create out of nothing. We create from what we have already discovered in reality. Uh, and that's in Vigno in the second sense of to do an inventory, to actually make a list, to observe what is there. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the sense, the kind of the bifocal, the Janus face of imagination as open and attentive, what Eliot calls the auditory imagination, that is mm -hmm. listening to what's happening out there uh, in other people and things. And you know, um, attention is the only prayer. You know. uh, and then on the other hand, um, uh, a creativity, uh, a leap into the new, and one needs both, it seems to me. Uh, can, can works of the poetic imagination cause change? Well, I think they can, but not directly. Mm -hmm. Seamus Heaney makes the point, uh, you know, no poem or is up to tank. And I think that's right. But at the same time, we know that mm -hmm. works of art have indirectly uh, and culturally prepared a space and a place and a time for change. Um, in Ireland, for example, there were many poets, Portrait Pierce and Yeats and so on, who prepared people, arguably, for change. Yeats even made this statement after the 1916 rising against the British. Uh, did that play of mine send out certain men the English shot? This play was Kathleen, uh, Countess Kathleen, Kathleen Luna, and Mother Ireland comes back and calls her sons to go and sacrifice themselves for the free nation. Now, that was Yeats being a bit presumptuous. I think about 10 people saw the play and none of them <laughs> got shot. But at the same time, the, 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 the consciousness uh, of 1916 and the way it radically changed people's opinion about independence was, in many respects, part of a cultural uh, revolution which preceded the political revolution. I wouldn't say it caused it, mm -hmm. but it meant that people interpreted the events in a different way. They saw the rebels as martyrs in a symbolism and a mythology of martyrdom that was part of a certain poetics and national poetics. Mm -hmm. And I would say, I'm talking Ireland because I'm Irish, that in Northern Ireland, the, the Good Friday Peace Agreement of uh, 19, um, gosh, your mind, I should know, 1998, I think, 1998, we'd have to check that out. Anyway, the Good Friday Peace Agreement 
uh, was, to my mind, also facilitated by the fact that so many Irish writers, poets, novelists, dramatists were, were writing about their adversaries. So you had Catholic writers writing from the point of view of Protestants, Protestant writers writing from the point of view of Catholics, you know, nationalist, unionist, I'm using Protestant Catholic for, mm -hmm. as kind of stand-ins for, for, for the two communities. And I think that exchange of narratives, of narrative imaginations, also had a, had a big impact in, in allowing people eventually to say, as it was written in the Good Friday Agreement, you can be British or Irish or both. You can be both. I mean, you don't have to kill each other for a united Ireland or a united kingdom, which are constitutionally incompatible, because sovereignty is one and indivisible. So you're united Ireland or united uh, kingdom, but you can't be both. Well, in imagination, you can. Constitutionally, you can't, but in imagination, you can. And that symbolic excess over factual incompatibility, I think, uh, had something to do with that. And then you can look at works like uh, Picasso's Guernica, or Sartre's political plays, or the role of uh, poets like Soresco and Dunescu in the uh, rising Romania, Václav Havel in Czechoslovakia. I mean, countless examples where distant writers uh, have created a space of contestation, but also of utopia, of thinking otherwise, which, which is all poets and artists can do, is create a space. They can't fill it in, and when they do, it's usually a disaster. Um, but it, it, to quote James Heaney again, it's a question of opening up a landing site for things to come. It's creating landing sites and then helping people to observe what, what is coming and interpreting what is coming. But, they, but art works in the realm of symbolism, not in the realm of ideology. And when the two conflate mm -hmm. or become too confused or fused, I think that's dangerous. Mm -hmm. they, yeah, it would take a, a certain refining of one's ontology of art, for example, to make sure that you, you know, poetry doesn't become propaganda. Yeah. Yeah. And it can be very thin-like.